This episode of I Work For Him is brought to you by SaferNet, online at safernet.com. You've tuned into I Work For Him, the voice of collaboration for the faith and work movement. And we are your hosts, Jim and Martha Brangenberg, and our mission is to transform the workplace of every Christian into a mission field. What does that look like in your workplace? Well, let's find out right now. You know, on I Work For Him, we've covered workplace stories of literally thousands of Christ followers from all over the world. We've covered people living out their faith as teachers, gym operators, lawn services, car sales, nurses, doctors, moms, dads, CEOs, and business owners. Several years back, we talked about the foster family and its challenges and the needs of the system in every state. But I don't think we ever covered the topic of being a foster parent as a job and as a calling. You see, all of us are called as followers of Jesus to take care of the widows and orphans of this world. We're not doing a great job in this. The foster system is full to overflowing, and there's a desperate need for families to host these kids and adopt these eligible kids out of the system. It's not an easy task. Just ask Abraham. He decided to foster his nephew Lot and look at all the trouble Lot got into. Did ever say he regretted it? Nope, he didn't. Well, today, we're going to dig deeper into this topic and hear from an expert and a practitioner about the call to foster. Cindy King joins us today from the Keystone State, where she's the coordinator for Cumberland County, Pennsylvania, for the Keystone Family Alliance. Cindy King, welcome to I Work For Him. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Well, we're excited to have you, Cindy. And before we get into your job that we are talking about today, we want to hear your Jesus story. Mm. I had the privilege of growing up in a home where I can't tell you the first time I heard about Jesus because I always heard about Jesus. But with that came a rich legacy of grandparents and great-grandparents who not only loved and followed Jesus, but served in the same ways that he served. And I look at that as the beginning of why I do what I do. Um, I particularly look at my grandparents who welcomed people into their home, people that didn't look like them, didn't believe like them, but just with open arms said, yep, we've got the room and the food and we'll feed you. And so come on and go ahead and live here. And um, I look at my cousins, many of whom have also fostered and or adopted. And I think there's a reason for that because the legacy was set and it was modeled for us all of our lives of course you know just like anyone else we live in a broken world and so there were definitely times I needed to learn more about who this Jesus is Um, needed to learn that he's not sitting up there somewhere just waiting for me to mess up and zap me and um grow into a better understanding of who he is but that's all part of the story of who I am and what I'm doing. Uh, my my first job was as a teacher and a special ed teacher. And again, I think that came from just wanting to help those who maybe can't help themselves and being that person for them. And so uh, those experiences that growing up um, in, in the home and the church and the school and the community that were all connected, that made me who I am. So how and why did you and your husband get into fostering? I mean, you just gave it, your grandparents that great example, others, but what was the impetus that got you started? All right. So my side of the story is that... Oh, when so we should have had your husband on is what you're saying? <laughs> we probably should have, but I can give you his story. Um, oh, convenient. But, okay. <laughs> and then you can fact check with him later. But in middle school, one of my best friends, her family started to foster. And that's probably the first time I even heard of fostering and started to understand what it was. And I watched this family that had very little in the way of things um, open their homes and their lives to these kids that needed them. And that spoke a lot to me and I never forgot it. And I started reading everything I could find about foster care and adoption. And sometimes I wonder if maybe social work wouldn't have been the field that I would go into. In fact, in high school, back in the day when career forms were, you know, they were paper pencil, and I took some kind of career assessment and it came out saying I should be a social worker. And I I always had said I was going to be a teacher. So I went back and changed my answers so that it would come out for teacher. <laughs> and and I and that was fine. I I loved it and I that was definitely where God wanted me to be, but I think the skill and the desire to work with families and children was also there. 
Um, so I knew I was going to be a foster or adoptive parent. So here's where John, my husband, comes into play. When we were dating, I told him this, that I was certain I was going to foster someday. And he said, no, that was not in his plan. And so I thought, well, if I just give him one of the books that I had read growing up, he would definitely see it my way and he would change his mind. So to his credit, he agreed to read the book, um, a book about a family that had adopted, I don't know, about a dozen kids, all with physical handicaps. And uh, he read it and he still said, no, this wasn't for him. And so I look back at that and I wonder why neither one of us said, well, then this relationship is not going to work out um, because we did get married and my husband graduated from college with a degree in psychology and sociology. And there's not much you can do with that until you have your master's. So while he was working on his master's, what did he find? A job as a foster care caseworker in inner city Philadelphia with medically fragile children during the 80s when, or 90s, when the issue, you know, the big issue was crack babies, cocaine ba babies born addicted to cocaine. And um, so a lot of interesting stories coming out of that, but that was the beginning of God changing his mind. And um, yeah, through there, it, it wasn't long. It was just a couple years later that we started to foster. So you both had some amazing, you know, background experiences. I mean, just this journey that God took you on. But when you started actually fostering, did you really realize what it was going to take personally and physically and spiritually to do this um, for your own fami family? No. I was a teacher and John was working on his degree to be a counselor. And then he did. He was a pastor for many years as well. We thought we had the skills to do this. Um, you know, we thought our biological children are doing well. We didn't go out to eat very often, but when we did, they were the kids that the people in the booth next to us would come over and say, oh, your children are so well behaved. We thought we had this parenting thing down. And uh, then when some more difficult, challenging behaviors came into our home, we realized that no, we were not prepared for this. <clears throat> So how many kids, and we're going to go deeper into this, of course, during the next segment, how many kids, though, have you and John fostered, and how many did you end up adopting? We have fostered off and on for about 30 years, and we have had 30 children in and out of our home. Four of them have stayed and have been adopted. Mm. That's fantastic. Because yeah, I saw a picture of your family uh, on the Keystone site. It's a, do you, I mean, you got kids everywhere. They're like flying everywhere. It's just, it's great. <laughs> Love that. Wow. So let's just take listen for a second. You know, there are other areas in our life where we need to foster and adopt new ideas. And one of these areas has to do with where we spend our money. If we're spiritually discerning and asking God to direct our paths, we may need to adopt new ways of thinking about what companies we utilize for our daily needs. Take our cell phones, for instance. Are we using companies that directly work against our biblical values? <laughs> Likely. Check out PatriotMobile.com forward slash I work for him to learn more about adopting a more biblical approach to your mobile phone service, faith, family, and freedom. PatriotMobile.com forward slash I work for him. You know, so as we have this conversation, Cindy, you know, it's so high level at this point. I mean, you know, seeing where God brought you guys' hearts together and then now knowing that you have fostered 30 plus children and brought some permanently into your home. Let's talk for the listeners, you know, is fostering, adopting, is it a calling or is it a biblical mandate? Like, help me sort that out. That's a really good question. And I think the biblical mandate is that we are to care for orphans and widows. Um, but it doesn't say we're all called to bring foster children into our homes. And so I think that's the distinction that, yes, we are all called to do something. Mm. But I think that it is a separate calling to bring children into our homes. Wow. That was that. That is such a great perspective because we can, you know, and this is where we're going to go in some future conversations that I hope our listeners are kind of leaning in and going, okay, so this, we've seen the scripture, right? It, to, to, to be there for the orphans and the widows. But what does that look like for each one of us individually? And it may look different. And um, so how did you guys discern that? I just would love to to hear for your own family. I how did we discern to foster? Yeah. So 
Okay, so it started when I was young and then, you know, coming into John realizing, yeah, this is something we could do. So we started out doing some child care for some of the children on his caseload. And that was kind mm. of just an easy way to ease into it that, okay, well, they're not staying for a long time. It's, it's a weekend or it's a day. We can do this. But then I think just both, it, my heart was already there, but then his heart started to break too for the fact that this, there are so many children and there are so many needs. And, and I will say that there was also a point of infertility there that also then, you know, for him was a, okay, so let's, let's take the next step because maybe this is the way God has planned for us to grow our family. Then we ended up having five biological children as well. But I was going to say, so God, was- <laughs> God backdoored you a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a problem put anymore. The pause, put the pause. All right. Oh, so you, you just mentioned something. So what is the state of the foster system countrywide? Countrywide, everywhere, there are more children waiting for families than families waiting for children. And what does that mean for each children and youth agency? It means that a child is removed from their home and they can't find a family for them. So caseworkers are sleeping in the offices with the children until a family can be found. Some of our counties um, and some of our agencies across the country, they're getting hotel rooms and the caseworkers spending the night or the week in the hotel room with the child. Sadly, it often means that children are being placed out of county because they can't find a home in that county. And so they have to go to another county that may not seem like a big deal, but it makes it more difficult to have visits with family members. Um, it also means that families are split up more often. Siblings are split up because mm. maybe they can found, find a family here that's willing to take one child, but they're not willing to take two or they're not willing to take teenagers. And we've got a lot of older kids in the foster care system. And so um, these are children's lives that we're, we're messing with. Um, removing them is a trauma. Spending some nights in a hotel room is a trauma. Having to be separated from siblings is another mm. trauma not being able to have visits because it's too far away. We're just, we're not serving children in the best ways that we can. God's got you placed in the Keystone State, the state of Pennsylvania. What's the situation there? Is it any different? Is it worse? Is it better? What what are you finding? It's pretty much the same. The other issue that we have here in Pennsylvania, which is somewhat pretty much countrywide as well, but we have the issue of caseworker turnover. And so when we have caseworker turnover, that directly impacts the child. If a child has one caseworker throughout their entire time in foster care, they have over 70% chance of achieving permanency, either going back home or being adopted or going to live with a family member. If they have even one caseworker change, that goes down to less than 20%. So that is a huge difference. So we have to be able to support our caseworkers. Um, We have counties that are, you know, they're supposed to have about 30 caseworkers and they have less than 10. It's Mm. that bad in some of our counties. That's because they have to make them sleep in hotels with foster kids. I mean, that that wasn't part of the job description, I'm sure. Exactly. Yeah. And, And what they see day in and day out, they're on the front lines. They sometimes their lives are threatened. And, you know, they have a position where nobody wants to see them show up at their door. So it's not like it's a friendly face at the door. And mm-hmm. so that's not easy. Um, yeah, when when there's so much turnover, they're overworked. They're burning out. There's such a thing as secondary trauma. Um, they can suffer from that as well because of everything that they're mm-hmm. having to face and, and watch and deal with. So yeah, it, it's not an easy place for them to be in. You know, I love having this conversation with you, even though it's a hard conversation, Cindy, because number one, you are living in the midst of it. You have such great um, knowledge and wisdom, and you tell such a compelling, um, you know, picture. You show a compelling picture to people as far as the reality of it. And so that's on one side of it. You've got the the caseworker issue. So what about the foster system itself and just the struggle to to even find families that want to foster? Uh, Let's talk about that for a minute. Why? Why why are they struggling? 
Yeah. So a, 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 a local news station just did a segment on this because they, they found out that, yeah, this is a problem. And actually, it, it's a problem that's gotten worse. It's not like it, it's been the same problem over time. And so we, we, we talked about what could some of those reasons be. Um, I think just the fact that trauma is so much more well known now. And so people are more aware of what kind of behaviors you might find in your home um, that that deters them part of it is just foster parent burnout and so we can't keep our foster parents mm -hmm. and that's a struggle because if you if you can keep them then you don't have to keep training them mm -hmm. you know there'll be natural turnover but when you're losing them more than the natural turnover then you have to keep finding them and training them honestly i think as christians i think part of the issue is that we've lost that that passion for living like Jesus did and going toward the brokenness and the messiness and being willing to step into that place. And this is a messy, broken place. Um, we are used to nice, comfortable lives here in the United States. And it, it, it you have to be willing to step out of that to be willing to step into fostering. And so some of it, I think, is just that we've lost our calling. We've lost what we've been told to do. And so it's harder to get people to do it. And, and having all of our kids involved in the foster system, having we been involved in the foster system, it is exhausting. I mean, it, it is challenging. Yeah. Uh, and bringing kids from somebody else's family into your household is a challenge. Uh, it is also rewarding. 30, how many years later? 31 years later. I mean, it's it's rewarding. I mean, we've we adopted one of our foster kids. Another one's still doing phenomenal. Never needed to adopt her. She was able to blossom outside of the system, and and with just but we're still very well connected. I'm amazed though at at how hard it is. I mean, it really is. You know, so as we talk about families, um, I think it's important for us to remember how vulnerable our loved ones can be online. We think about all the vulnerabilities of, of children in situations where they don't have control, but in our own home, our own loved ones can be vulnerable online. And so SaferNet is a service that helps us to protect the ones we love from the evil that's out there lurking on the internet. SaferNet.com can tell you more about how it works at home and in your office, and it can give you peace of mind for your loved ones. It's, it's an internet filter, a website filter, a VPN to protect you when you're online so people can't see. It's got so much to offer. Check it out online, safernet.com. So Cindy, you mentioned that it's really maybe a calling to have people come into your home because it's such different, but is fostering a vocation? Is adopting a vocation? Now you brought up a controversial word, yes, vocation. Yes, I did. <laughs> Everybody has a different definition of vocation. So I think if you're looking at vocation as not a career, but as your calling, but more than your calling as the person you are called to be, then I think that we are all called to model our lives after Christ. That's going to look differently for each one of us. Mm -hmm. So yes, Fostering can be somebody's vocation, but they could also have other vocations as well. You can foster and also be a teacher. You can foster and also be an engineer. It's, it's not its own vocation. You know, it's kind of interesting that you say it that way because... Honestly, we are all called to be bivocational in a sense. You know, we, we, we reference pastors and say, well, if your pastor also has a job, he's considered bivocational. But at the same time, aren't we all called to that? That's what you just said. You know, God yeah. gives us a calling and sometimes our job fulfills that calling because of how he's gifted us. But sometimes our job for a season is truly just a paycheck and our calling might be something in addition that we are doing on the side or, and that may be the fostering or adopting because it's choosing something else to be invited into your life. And um, I love that. And I think it's a good challenge for each one of us to say, you know, what am I doing right now in that aspect? So how have you seen God's hand in this whole process for your family? Mm, it kind of goes along with that question of vocation in that, you know, the person we are to be is to to live a life that's modeled after the life of Christ. 
but also to be growing in holiness like Christ. And what better way to grow in holiness than to be in a place where your only choice is to be on your knees asking for wisdom and guidance and grace and love to be able to pass on to a child that may be acting out in the most unloving ways. And so um, I know Gary Thomas has written a book about marriage where he says that um, something like this, marriage is not to make us happy, it's to make us holy. Mm -hmm. I think the same thing is true of parenting, but especially of foster parenting. Um, You know, there, there are many days that joy was hard to find. But I look at this journey as one that has definitely brought me deeper in my relationship with Christ and has forced me to see those sin issues in my life and to work on them. Because if I'm not working on myself and my struggles, then I can't help my children. Um, Karen, Dr. Karen Purvis is somebody who's done a lot of research in trauma-informed care. And she says, we can't take our children to a place that of healing that we have not been to ourselves. Ooh. And so that has been huge for me. So talk to our audience. I mean, they, they're, they're curious. They're going, okay, why should they consider becoming a foster parent? Because it's so needed and it is so rewarding. I will add, you have to change your definition of success. Success is not that by age 18, this child is going to have it all together and say, thank you for bringing me into your home and thank you for leading me in this direction and thank you for all you've done. And yes, now I'm going to follow Christ and I'm going to give my life over and I'm going to change all of my ways. It can take longer than that, but we do it because we are called to do it. And I, when people, people always say, and especially when we, when, when all nine children were still at home, we had a family band. They all played string instruments. We would pile them all into the 15 passenger van. We'd drive from here to there and we'd get out and people would ask, is this a daycare? Is it a youth group? Are you on a missions trip? And we would explain how our family came to be. And inevitably somebody would say, I could never do what you do. Mm. And I've had different responses to that through the years. <laughs> and I think my response now is, why not? Right. We're not all called to do it, but I do think for some people that's an excuse to not do it. I could never do that. It's just too easy to put it there. Or I could never say goodbye. I could never whatever. I could never do that to the other children in my home or whatever the excuse is. But I think we have to lay that all down before the Lord and find out if they are just ex- excuses or if maybe the response is, okay, right, not fostering, but what are you going to do to serve vulnerable people? Mm. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a podcast talking about what can you do to wrap yourself around some of those foster parents who say, I may not know how to do it. Maybe I really can't do it, but I'm going to try, but they're going to need your help. And we're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. We're going to talk about wraparound grandparenting. Cindy, before we go, any final thoughts that you'd like to share just out of your open heart with everybody about fostering as a vocation, fostering as your job, and being involved in the foster system? It is so rewarding to be able to look at a child, a teen, an adult, and say, you are loved, you are valuable, you are precious, you are important. We know from research that all it takes to help a child heal from past trauma is one caring adult that just keeps showing up and loves as unconditionally as is humanly possible. Any one of us can be that one caring adult for somebody, whether it's a foster child or somebody in your workplace or somebody at church or somebody in your neighborhood. What would it look like if every believer showed up for one other person? Mm. And so that would be what I would leave with everybody, whether it's fostering or not, we can all be that one caring person. So beautiful. So tell people quickly how they can get a hold of you and learn more about Keystone Family Alliance. So my email is Cindy, C-I-N-D-Y at keyfam, K-E-Y-F-A-M dot org. Um, Also, our website, keyfam.org. 
Uh, as Jim was saying, there is a picture of my family on there, although it's not everybody because it's hard to get everybody in the same place at the same time when there's now in-laws and grandchildren. Um, but definitely check it out on that website. You can see which counties we are in. Keystone Family Alliance is county based. And so there's a coordinator in 18 counties now with the goal of eventually being in all 67 counties. But if you, there's a coordinator in your county, definitely try to connect and find out where you can serve. We are the bridge between the needs of the child welfare system and the local church. So we find out what the needs are. Then we go back to the local church and we say, we are the ones who were given the mandate to do this from the Old Testament, from the time when there was a plan in place. When you harvest your field, don't go back over it a second time. Leave some because there are people who are going to mm. need it. And so from the beginning, this was our job to do. And we weren't doing a good job of it. So we, and I say we, the church, the big C church said to the government, hey, could you help us out? And then we let them take it over. And the church, the government does not make a very good parent. So we at <laughs> Keystone Family Alliance are trying to do what we can to let the church know that we have to come back and take our rightful place in, in this issue. And we need to stand up for the kids and for the families. Mm -hmm. And we need to be there for them and support them and encourage them. Cindy King, thanks so much for being on iWork for him today. We look forward to getting back with you in a couple of weeks to talk about wraparound grandparenting. But thank you, Cindy King. You've been listening to I Work For Him with your host, Jim and Martha Brangenberg. We're Christ followers. Our workplace is our mission field, but ultimately, I, I work, work for him. him. This episode of I Work For Him is brought to you by SaferNet, online at safernet.com. We have an app for that? What? An app for cybersecurity for all your devices? Are you a business owner concerned about cybersecurity? SaferNet VPN offers the perfect solution. Protect your company and family with a single app. With our cloud-connected cybersecurity platform, enjoy VPN, internet controls, and virus protection. Stay safe online with SaferNet VPN today. Get secured now. Sign up at SaferNet.com. That's SaferNet.com. Did you know that God has a calling on your life? It's true. He's called you to bring Jesus to the world. For some, that may look like a pulpit or a foreign mission field, but for most of us, it looks like a construction site, a cubicle, a hospital, or a classroom. Wherever it is that you work, live, volunteer, and invest, that is your mission field. To learn more about integrating your faith into your work and retirement, check out our books, I Work For Him, She Works For Him, and I Retire For Him, by going to iworkforhim.com slash bookstore. Thanks for listening to the I Work For Him podcast with your hosts, Jim and Martha Brangenberg. Please visit iWorkForHim.com to learn more about connecting your faith and work, to join the I Work For Him nation, or subscribe to our weekly blog. You can also follow us on social media at I Work For Him to stay up to date and meet our guests. If today's message spoke to you, please subscribe, rate, and review the show on your favorite podcast platform. Your review will launch more workplace missionaries across America. That's at I Work For Him and online at iworkforhim.com. I work, the number four, him.com. <laughs>